Chapter 4 First Weeks on the Island When I waked, it was broad day, the weather clear and the storm abated, so that the sea did not rage and swell as before. But that which surprised me most was that the ship was lifted off in the night from the sand where she lay by the swelling of the tide and was driven up almost as far as the rock which I at first mentioned, where I had been so bruised by the wave dashing me against it, this being within about a mile from the shore where I was, in the ship seeming to stand upright still. I wished myself on board, that at least I might save some necessary things for my use. When I came down from my apartment in the tree, I looked about me again, and the first thing I found was the boat, which lay as the wind in the sea had toothed her up upon the land about two miles on my right hand. I walked as far as I could upon the shore to have got to her, but found a neck or inlet of water between me and the boat which was about half a mile broad, so I came back for the present, being more intent upon getting at the ship, where I hoped to find something for my present subsistence. A little after noon, I found the sea very calm, and the tide a bed so far out that I could come within a quarter of a mile of the ship, and here I found a fresh renewing of my grief. So I saw evidently that if we had kept on board, we had been all safe. And is to say, we had all got safe on shore. And I had not been so miserable as to be left entirely destitute of all comfort and company as I now was. This forced tears to my eyes again. But as there was little relief in that, I resolved, if possible, to get to the ship. So I pulled off my clothes, and the weather was hot so extremely, and took the water. But when I came to the ship, my difficulty was still greater to know how to get on board. For, as she lay aground and high out of the water, there was nothing within my reach to lay hold of. I swam round her twice, and the second time I spied a small piece of rope, which I wondered I did not see at first, hang down by the force chain so low, as that with great difficulty I got hold of it, and by the help of that rope I got up into the forecastle of the ship. Here I found that the ship was bulged and had a great deal of water in her hold, but she lay so on on the side of a bank of hard sand, or rather earth that her stern lay lifted up upon the bank and her head low almost to the water, by this means all her quarter was free, and all that was in that part was dry, for you may be sure my first work was to search, and to see what was spoiled and what was free, and first I found that all the ship's provisions were dry and untouched by the water, and being very well disposed to eat, I went to the bread room and filled my pockets with biscuits and ate it as I went about other things, so I had no time to lose. I also found some rum in the great cabin, of which I took a large drum, and which I had, indeed, need enough of to spirit me for what was before me. Now I wanted nothing but a boat to furnish myself with many things which I foresaw would be very necessary to me. It was in vain to sit still and wish for what was not to be had, and this extremely roused my application. We had several spare yards in two or three large spars of wood, and a spare tap mast or two in the ship. I resolved to fall to work with these, and I flung as many of them overboard as I could manage for their weight, trying every one with a rope, and that they might not drive away. When it was done, I went down the ship's side, and pulling them to me, I tied four of them together at both ends as well as I could, in the form of a draft, and laying two or three short pieces of plank 
upon them crossways. I found I could walk upon it very well, but that I was not able to bear any great weight, the pieces being too light. So I went to work, and with a carpenter's soul, I cut a spare topmast into three lengths and added them to my raft with a great deal of labor and pains. But the hope of furnishing myself with necessaries encouraged me to go beyond what I should have been able to have done upon another occasion. My raft was now strong enough to bear any reasonable weight. My next care was what to load it with and how to preserve where I laid upon it from the surf of the sea. But I was not long considering this. I first laid all the planks or boards upon it that I could get, and having considered well what I most wanted, I got three of the seams chests, which I had broken open and emptied and lowered them down upon my raft. In the first of these I filled with provisions, with bread, rice, three Dutch cheeses, five pieces of dried goat's flesh, which we lived much upon, and a little remainder of European corn, which had been laid by for some foals which we brought to sea with us, but the foals were killed. There had been some barley and weather together, but to my great disappointment I found afterwards that the rats had eaten or spoiled it all. As for liquors, I found several cases of bottle belonging to our skipper, in which were some cordial waters, and, in all, about five or six gallons of wreck. These I stowed by themselves, there being no need to put them into the chest, nor any room for them. When I was doing this, I found the tide begin to flow, though very calm, and I had the mortification to see my coat, shirt, and waistcoat which I had left on the shore, upon the sand, swim away. As for my breeches, which were only linen and open kneeled, I swam on board in them, in my stockings. However, this saved me on rummaging for clothes, of which I found enough, but took no more than I wanted for present use, for I had other things which my eye was more upon, as, first, tools to work with on shore, and it was after long searching that I found out the carpenter's chest, which was, indeed, a very useful prize to me, and much more valuable than a shipload of gold would have been at that time. I got it down to my raft, all as it was, without losing time to look into it, for I knew in general what it contained. My next care was for some ammunition and arms, there were two very good folding pieces in the great cabin, and two pistols. These I secured first, with some powder horns and a small bag of shot, and two old rusty swords. I knew there were three barrels of powder in the ship, but I knew not where our gunner had stowed them. But with much search I found them, two of them dry and good. The third had taken water. Those two I got to my raft with the arms, and now I thought myself very well freighted, and begun to think how I should get to shore with them, having neither sail or nor rudder, and the least capful of wind would have overset all my navigation. I had three encouragements. First, a smooth, calm sea. Secondly, the tide rising and setting in the shore. Thirdly, what little wind there was blew me towards the land. And thus, having found two or three broken oars belonging to the boat, and besides the tools which were in the chest, I found two sows, an axe, and a hammer. With this cargo, I put to sea. For a mile or thereabout, my raft went very well, only that I found it drive a little distance from the place where I had landed before, by which I perceived that there was some indraft of the water, and consequently I hoped to find some creek or river there, which I might make use of as a port to get to land with my cargo. As I imagined, so it was, there appeared before me a little opening of the land, and I found a strong current of the tide set into it, 
so I guided my raft as well as I could to keep in the middle of the storm. But here I had like to have suffered a second shipwreck, which, if I had, I think verily would have broken my heart. For, knowing nothing of the coast, my raft ran aground to one end of it upon a shoal, and now being a groat at the other end, it wanted but a little that all my cargo had slipped off towards the end that was afloat, and to falling into the water, I did my utmost by setting my back against the chest to keep them in their places, but could not thrust off the raft with all my strength. Neither trust I steer from the posture I was in, but holding up the chest with all my might, I stood in that manner near half an hour, in which time the rising of the wire brought me a little more upon a level, and a little after, the wire still rising, my raft floated again, and I thrust her off with the oar I had into the channel, and then, driving up higher, I at length found myself in the mouth of a little river, with land on both sides, and a strong current of tide running up. I looked on both sides for a proper place to get to shore, for I was not willing to be driven too high up the river, hoping in time to see some ships at sea, and therefore resolved to place myself as near the coast as I could. At length I spied a little cove on the right shore of the creek, to which with great pain and difficulty I guided my raft, and at last got so near that, reaching ground with my oar, I could thrust her directly in. But here I had like to have dipped all my cargo into the sea again, for that shore lay in pretty steep, that is to say slopping. There was no place to land, but where one end of my float, if it ran on shore, would lie so high and the other sink lower, as before, that it would endanger my cargo again. All that I could do was to wait till the tide was at the highest, keeping the raft with my oar like an unshore, to hold the side of it fast to the shore, near a flat piece of ground, which I expected the water would flow over. And so it did. As soon as I found water enough, for my raft drew about a foot of water, I thrust her upon that flat piece of ground, and there fastened or moored her, by sticking my two broken oars into the ground, one on one side near one end, and one on the other side the near the other end, and thus I lay to the water a bed away, and left my raft and all my cargo safe on shore. My next work was to view the country, and seek a proper place for my habitation, and where to stow my goods to secure them from wherever might happen. Where I was, I yet knew not, whether on the continent, on an island, whether inhabited or not inhabited, whether in danger of wild beasts or not. There was a hill not above a mile from me, which rose up very steep and high, and which seems to overtop some other hills, which lay as in a ride from it northward. I took out one of the one of the falling pieces and one of the pistols and a horn of powder, and thus armed, I travelled for discovery up to the top of that hill, where, after I had with great labour and difficulty got to the top, I saw an effect to my great affliction, was that that I was in an island environed every way with the sea, no land to be seen except some rocks which lay a great way off, in two small islands, less than this, which lay about three leagues to the west. I found also that the island I was in was barren, and, as I saw good reason to believe, uninhabited except by wild beasts, of whom, however, I saw none, yet I saw abundance of foals, but I knew not their kinds, neither when I killed them could I tell was what was fit for food and what not. Am I coming back? I shoot at a great bird 
which I saw set on upon a tree on the side of a grey wood. I believe it was the first gun that had been fired there since the creation of the world. I had no sooner fired, and from all parts of the wood there arose an innumerable number of falls of many sorts, making a confused screaming and crying, and every one according to this usual note, but not one of them of any kind that I knew. As for the creature I killed, I took it to be a kind of hawk, its color and beak resembling it, and it had no talon or claws more than common. Its flesh was carrion and fit for nothing. Contented with this discovery, I came back to my raft and fell to work to bring my cargo on shore, which took me up the rest of that day. What to do with myself at night? I knew not, nor indeed where to rest, for I was afraid to lay down on the ground, not knowing but some wild beast might devour me, though, as I afterwards found, there was really no need for those fears. However, as soon as I could, I barricaded myself round with the chests and boards that I had brought on shore, and made a kind of hut for that night's lodging. As for food, I yet saw not which way to supply myself, except that I had seen two or three creatures like Harry's run out of the woods where I should fall. I now begun to consider that I might yet get a great many things out of the ship which would be useful to me, in particularly some of the rigging and sails, and such other things as might come to land. And I resolved to make another voyage on board the vessel if possible and as i knew that the first storm that blew must necessarily break her all in pieces i resolved to set all other things apart till i had got everything out of the ship that i could get then i called the council that is to say in my thoughts whether i should take back the raft but this appeared impracticable so i resolved to go as before when the tide was down and i did so only that i stripped before i went from my hut having nothing on but my checkered shirt bare flinging drawers and a pair of pumps on my feet i got on board the ship as before and prepared a second draft and having had experience of the first i neither made this so unwildly nor loaded it so hard but yet i bought away several things very useful to me as first in the carpenter's stores i found two or three bags full of nails and spikes a gray crew jack a dozen or two of hatchets and above all that most useful thing called the greenstone all these i secured together with several things belonging to the gunner particularly two or three iron crows and two barrels of musket bullets seven muskets another falling pieces with some small quantity of powder more a large bag full of small shot and a grey roll of sheet lead but this last was so heavy i could not hoist it up to get it over the ship's side besides these things i took all the men's clothes that i could find and a spare for topsail, a hammock, and some bedding, and with this I loaded my second draft, and bought them all safe on shore, to my very great comfort. I was under some apprehension during my absence from the land that at least my provisions might be deferred on shore, but when I came back I found no sign of any visitor, only there sat a creature like a wild cat upon one of the chests which when I came towards it, ran away a little distance, and then stood still. She sat very composed and unconcerned, and looked full in my face, as if she had a mind to be acquainted with me. I presented my gun at her, but as she did not understand it, she was perfectly unconcerned at it, nor did she offer to steer away, upon which I toothed her a bit of biscuit, though by the way, I was not very free of it, for my store was not great. However, I spared her a bit, I say, and she went to it, smelled at it, and ate it, and looked, as if pleased, for more. 
but I thanked her and could spare no more, so she marched off. Having got my second cargo on shore, for I was fain to open the barrels of powder and bring them my parcels, for they were too heavy, being large cracks. I went to work to make me a little tent with the sail and some poles which I cut for that purpose. And into this tent I brought everything that I knew would spoil either with rain or sun, and I piled all the empty chests and casks up in a circle round the tent to fortify it from any sudden attempt, either from man or beast. When I had done this, I blocked up the door of the tent with some boards within, and an empty chest set up and set up on and without, and spreading one of the beds upon the ground, laying my two pistols just at my head and my gun at length by me. I went to bed for the first time, and slept very quietly all night, for I was very weary and heavy, for the night before I had slept little, and had labored very hard all day to fetch all those things from the ship, and to get them on shore. I had the biggest magazine of all kinds now that ever was laid up, I believe, for one man, but I was not satisfied still, for while the ship sat upright in that posture, I thought I ought to get everything out of her that I could, so every day at low water I went on board, and brought away something or other, but particularly the third time I went I brought away as much of the rinning as I could, as also all the small ropes and rope twin I could get, with a piece of spare canvas which was to mend the sails upon occasion, and a barrel of wet gunpowder, and a word I brought away all the sails, first and last, only that I was fain to cut them in pieces, and bring as much at a time as I could, from they were no more useful to be sails, but as mere canvas only. But that which confronted me more still was that last of all, after I had made five or six such voyages as these, and thought I had nothing more to expect from the ship that I was worth my mandolin with. I say, after all this, I found a great hogshead of bread, three large roundlets of rum, or spirits, a box of sugar, and a barrel of fine flour. This was surprising to me, because I had given over expecting any more provisions, except that was spoiled by the water. I soon emptied the hogshead of the bread and wrapped it up, parcel by parcel, in piece of the sails, which I cut out. And, in a word, I got all this safe on shore also. The next day I made another voyage, and now, having plundered the ship of what was portable and fit to hand out, I began with the cables, cutting the great cable into pieces, such as I could move. I got two cables and a halster on shore, with all the iron work I could get. And having cut down the spirit sail yard and the mizzen yard, and everything I could to make a large raft, I loaded it with all these heavy goods, and came away, but my good luck began now to leave me, for this raft was so unwieldy and so overladen, that after I had entered the little cove where I had landed the rest of my goods, not being able to guide it so handily as I did the other. It overset, and threw me all my cargo into the water, and for myself it was not great harm, for I was near the shore, but as to my cargo, it was a great part of it lost, especially the iron, which I expected would have been of great use to me. However, when the tide was out, I got most of the pieces of the cable ashore, and came off the and some of the iron, though with infinite labor, for I was fain to dip for it into the water, a work which fatigued me very much. After this, I went every day on board, and brought away what I could get. I had been now thirteen days on shore, and had been eleven times on board the ship, in which time I had brought away all that one pair of hands could well be supposed capable to bring. Though I believed verily that the calm weather held, I should have brought away the whole ship piece by piece, but preparing the twelfth time to go on board, 
I found the wind begun to rise. However, at low water, I went on board. And though I thought I had ramaged the cabin so effectually that nothing more could be found, yet I discovered a locker with drawers in it, in one of which I found two or three razors and one pair of large scissors with some ten or a dozen of good knives and forks. And another I found about 36 pounds value in money, some European coin, some Brazil, some pieces of eight, some gold, and some silver. I smiled to myself at the sight of this money. Oh, drug! And said I aloud, What art thou good for? Thou art not worth to me. No, not the takings of the ground. One of those knives is worth all this heap. I had no manner of use for thee, or for then remain where thou art, and go to the bottom of a creature whose life is not worth saying. However, upon second thoughts I took it away, and wrapping all this in a piece of canvas, I began to think of making another raft. But while I was preparing this, I found the sky overcast, and the wind began to rise. In a quarter of an hour, it blew a flash of fresh gale from the shore. It presently occurred to me that it was in vain to pretend to make a raft with the wind offshore, and that it was my business to be gone before the tide of float began. Otherwise, I might not be able to reach the shore at all. Accordingly, I let myself down into the water and swam across the channel, which lay between the ship and the sands, and even that with difficulty enough, partly with the weight of the things I had about me, and partly the roughness of the water. For the wind rose very hastily, and before it was quite high, water it blew a storm. But I got home to my little tent, where I lay, with all my wealth about me, very secure. It blew very hard all night, and in the morning, when I looked out, behold, no more ship was to be seen. I was a little surprised, but I recovered myself with the satisfactory reflection that I had lost no time, nor abandoned any diligence, to get everything out of her that could be useful to me, and that, indeed, there was little left in her that I was able to bring away, if I had had more time. I now gave over any more thoughts of the ship, or of anything out of her, except that my drive on shore from her wreck, as, indeed, divers pieces of her afterwards did, and those things were of small use to me. My thoughts were now wholly employed about securing myself against either savages, if any should appear, or wild beasts, if any were in the island, and I had many thoughts of the method how to do this and what kind of dwelling to make, whether I should make me a cave in the earth or a tent upon the earth. And, in short, I resolved upon both, the manner and description of which I may not be improper to give an account of. I soon found the place I was in was not fit for my settlement, because it was upon a low, boorish ground near the sea, and I believed it would be wholesome, and more particularly because there was no fresh water near it. So I resolved to find a more healthy and more convenient spot of ground. I consulted several things in my situation, which I found would be proper for me. First, health and fresh water are just now mentioned. Secondly, shelter from the heat of the sun. Thirdly, security from ravenous creatures, whether men or beast. Fourthly, a view to the sea, that if God sent any ship in sight, I might not lose any advantage for my deliverance, of which I was now willing to banish all my expectation yet. In search of a place proper for this, I found a little plain and the side of a rising hill, whose from towards this little plain was steep as a house side, so that nothing could come down upon me from the top. On the other side of the rock 
There was a hollow place, worn a little way in, like the entrance or door of a cave, but there was not really any cave or way into the rock at all. On the flat of the green, just before this hollow place, I resolved to pitch my tent. This plain was not above a hundred yards broad, the yards broad, and about twice as long, and lay like a green before my door, and at the end of it, descended irregularly every way down into the low ground by the seaside. It was on the NNW side of the hill, so that it was sheltered from the heat every day, till it came to a W and by S sun, and thereabouts, which in those countries is near the setting. Before I set up my tent, I drew a half circle for the hollow place, which took in about 10 yards in its semi diameter from the rock, and 20 yards in its diameter from its beginning and ending, and its semi diameter from the rock, and 20 yards in its diameter from its beginning and ending. And in this half circle, I pitched two rows of strong sticks driving them into the ground till they stood very firm like piles and the biggest in being out of the ground above five feet and a half and sharpened on the top the two rows did not stand above six inches from one another then i took the pieces of cable which i had got in the ship and laid them in rows one upon another within the circle between these two rows of stakes up to the top placing other stakes in the inside, leaning against them, about two feet and a half high, like a spur to a, like a, spur to a post. And this fence was so strong that neither man nor beast could get into it or over it. This cost me a great deal of time and labor, especially to cut the piles in the woods, bring them to the place, and drive them into the earth. The entrance into this place I made to be not by a door but by a short ladder to go over the top which ladder when I was in I left it over after me so I was completely fenced in and fortified as I thought from all the world and consequently slept secure in the night which otherwise I could not have done though as it appeared afterwards there was no need of all this caution from the enemies that I apprehended danger from, into this fence or fortress, with infinite labor. I carried all my riches, all my provisions, ammunition, and stores, of which you have the account above, as I made a large tent, which to preserve me from the rains that in one part of the year are very violent there, I made double one smaller tent within, and one larger tent above it, and covered the utmost with a large tarpaulin, which I had saved among the sails. And now I lay no more of a while in the bed which I had brought on shore, but in a hammock, which was indeed a very good one, and belonged to the mate of the ship. And to this tent I bore all my provisions, and everything that would spoil by the wet and having thus enclosed all of my goods i made up the entrance which till now i had left open and so passed and repassed as i said by a short later when i had done this i began to work my way into the rock and bring in all the earth and stones that i dug down out through my tent i laid them up within my fence, in the nature of a terrace, so that it raised the ground within about a foot and a half. And thus I made me a cave, just behind my tent, which served me like a cellar to my house. It cost me much labor in many days before all these things were brought to perfection, and therefore I must go back to some other things which took up some of my thoughts. At the same time it happened, after I had laid my scheme to the setting up my tent and making the cave, that a storm of rain falling from a thick, dark cloud, a sudden flash of lightning happened, and after that a great clap of thunder, as is naturally the effect of it. 
I was not so much surprised with the lightning as I was with the thoughts which darted into my mind as swift as the lightning itself. Oh, my powder! My very heart sank into me when I thought that, at one blast, all my powder might be destroyed, on which not my defense only, but the providing my food, as I thought, entirely depended. I was nothing near so anxious about my own danger, though, had the powder took fire, I should never have known who had hurt me. Such impression did this make upon me that after the storm was over, I laid aside all of my works, my building and fortifying, and applied myself to make bags and boxes, to separate the powder and to keep it a little and a little in a parcel, in the hope that whatever might come, it might not all take fire at once, and to keep it so apart that it should not be possible to make one part fire another. I finished this work in about a fortnight, and I think my powder, which in all was about 240 pounds weight, was divided in not less than a hundred parcels. As to the barrel that had been wet, I did not apprehend any danger from that, so I placed it in my new cave, which, in my fancy, I called my kitchen, and the rest I hid up and down in holes among the rocks so that no wet might come to it, making very carefully where I laid it. In the interval of time, while this was doing, I went out once, at least, every day with my gun, as well to divert myself as to see if I could kill anything fit for food, and, as near as I could, to acquaint myself with what the island produced. The first time I went out, I presently discovered that there were goats in the island, which was a great satisfaction to me, but then it was attended with this misfortune to me, with that they were so shy, so subtle, and so swift of foot, that it was the most difficult thing in the world to come at them. But I was not discouraged at this, not doubting but I might now and then shoot one as it soon happened, nor after I had found their hunts a little. I laid wait in this manner for them. I observed if they saw me in the hollies, though they were upon the rocks, they would run away, and in a terrible fright. But if they were feeding in the valleys, and I was upon the rocks, they took no notice of me. From whence, I concluded that, by the position of their objects, their sight, was so directed downward that they did not really see objects that were of them. So afterwards, I took this method. I always climbed the rocks first to get above them, and then had frequently a fair mark. The first shot I made among these creatures, I killed a she-goat, which had a little kid by her, which she gave suck to, which grieved me, Hardly, for when the old one fell, the kid stood stock, still by her, till I came and took her up. And not only so, but when I carried the old one with me upon my shoulders, the kid followed me quite to my enclose, upon which I laid down the dam, and took the kid in my arms, and carried it over my pail, in hopes to have bred it up tame. But it would not but it would not eat. So I was forced to kill it and eat it myself. These two supplied me with flesh a great while. So I ate springly and saved my provisions, my bread especially, as much as possibly I could. Having now fixed my habitation, I found it absolutely necessary to provide a place to make a fire in and fuel to burn, and what I did for that, and also how I enlarged my cave, and what conveniences I made, I shall give a full account of it, its place, but I must now give some little account of myself, and of my thoughts about living, which, it may well be supposed, 
were not a few. I had the dismissal prospect of my condition, for as I was not cast away upon that island without being driven, as is it, by a violent storm, quite out of the course of our intended voyage in a great way, with some hundreds of leagues out of the ordinary course of the trade of mankind, I had great reason to consider it as a determination of heaven, and in this desolate place, and in this desolate manner, I should end my life. The tears would run plentifully down my face when I made these reflections, and sometimes I would expostulate with myself my why providence should thus completely run his creatures and render them so absolutely miserable so without help abandoned so entirely depressed that it could hardly be rational to be thankful for such a life but something always returned swift upon me to check these thoughts and to reprove me and particularly one day walking with my gun in my hand by the seaside i was very pensive upon the subject of my present condition when reason as it were expostulated with me the other way thus well you are in a desolate condition it is true but pray remember where are the rest of you did not you come eleven of you in the boat where are the ten why were they not saved and you lost why were you singled out is it better to be here or there and then i pointed to the sea all evils are to be considered with the good that is in them and with that worse attends them then it occurred to me again how well i was furnished for my substance in what would have been my case if it had not happened which was a hundred thousand to me that the ship floated from the place where she first struck and was driven to so near to the shore that i had time to get all these things out of her what would have been my case if i had been forced to have lived in the condition in which i at first came on shore without necessaries of life or necessaries to supply and produce them particularly said i aloud though to myself what should i have done without a gun without ammunition without any tools to make anything or to work with without clothes bedding a tent or any manner of covering and that now i had all of these to sufficient quantity that was in a fair way to provide myself in such a manner as to live without my gun when my ammunition was spent so that i had a tolerable view of subsisting without any want as long as i lived for i considered from the beginning how i would provide for the incidents that might happen and for the time that was to come even not only after my ammunition should be spent but even after my health and strength should decay i confess i had not entrained any notion of my ammunition being destroyed at one blast i mean my powder being blown up by the lightning and this made the thought of it so surprising to me when it lightened and thundered as i observed just now and now being about to enter into a melancholy relation of a scene of silent life such perhaps as was never heard of in the world before i shall take it from its beginning and continue in it its order it was by my account the thirtieth of september when in the manner as above said i first set foot upon this horrid island when the sun begin to us in its autumnal exynos was almost over my head for i reckoned myself by observation to be in the latitude of nine degrees twenty two minutes north of the line after i had been there about ten or twelve days it came into my thoughts 
that I should lose my reckoning of time for want of books and pen and ink, and should even forget the Sabbath days. And to prevent this, I cut with my knife upon a large post and capital letters in making it into a great cross. I set it up on the shore where I first landed. I came on shore here on the 30th of September, 1659. Upon the sides of this square post, I cut every day a notch with my knife, and every seventh notch was as long against as the rest, and every first day of the month as long again as that long one. And thus, I kept my calendar, or weekly, monthly, and yearly reckoning of time. In the next place, we are to observe that among the many things which I brought out of the ship, in the several voyages which, as above mentioned, I made to it, I got several things of less value, but not all less useful to me, which I omitted setting down before, as, in particular, pens, ink and paper, several parcels in the captains, mates, gunners and carpenters keeping three or four compasses, some mathematical instruments, dials, perspectives, charts and books of navigation, all which I handled together, whether I might want them or no. Also, I found three very good Bibles, which came to me in my cargo from England, in which I had backed up among my things, some Portuguese books also, and among them two or three popish prayer books, and several other books, all which I carefully secured, and I must not forget that we had in the ship a dog and two cats, of whose eminent history I may have occasion to say something in its place. So I carried both the cats with me, and as for the dog, he jumped out of the ship of himself, and swam on shore to me the day after I went on shore with my first cargo, and was a trusty servant to me many years. I wanted nothing that he could fetch me, nor any company that he could make up to me. I only wanted to have him talk to me, but that would not do. As I observed before, I found pens, inks, and paper, and I husbanded them to the utmost. And I should show that while my ink lasted, I kept things very exact. But after that was gone, I could not, for I could not make any ink by any means that I could devise. And this put me in mind that I wanted many things, notwithstanding all that I had amazed, amassed together. And of these, ink was one, and also a spade, pickaxe, and shovel, to dig or remove the earth, needles, pins, and thread. As for linen, I soon learned to want that without much difficulty. This want of tools made every work I did go on heavily, and it was near a whole year before I had entirely finished my little pail or surrounded my habitation, the piles or stakes, which were as heavy as I could well lift, were a long time in cutting and preparing the woods, and more, by far, in bringing home, so that I spent sometimes two days in cutting and bringing home one of those posts and a third day in driving it into the ground, for which purpose I got a heavy piece of wood at first, but at last bethought myself of one of the iron crows, which, however, that I found it made driving those posts or piles very laborious and tedious work. But what need I have been concerned at the tediousness of anything I had to do, seeing I had time enough to do it in, nor had I any other employment, and that had been over, at least that I could foresee, except the ranging the island to seek for food, which I did, more or less, every day.
I had now begun to consider seriously my condition and the circumstances I was reduced to, and I drew up the state of my affairs and writing, not so much to leave them to any that were to come after me, for I was likely to have but few years as to deliver my thoughts from daily pouring over them, and afflicting my mind, and as my reason began now to master my despondency, I began to comfort myself as well as I could, and to set the good against the evil, that I might have something to distinguish my case from worse. And I stated very impartially, like debtor and creditor, the comforts I enjoyed against the miseries I suffered. Thus, evil, I am cast upon a horrible, desolate island, void of all hope of recovery. Good, but I'm alive, and now drowned, as all my ship's company he were evil. I am signed out and desperate, as it were, from all the world to be miserable. Good, but I am singled out, too, from all the ship's crew to be separated from death. And he that miraculously saved me from death can deliver me from this condition. Evil. I am divided from mankind, a solitaire, one banished from human society. Good. But I am not starved, and perishing on a barren place, afforded no sustenance. Evil. I have no clothes to cover me. Good. But I am in a hot climate, where, if I had clothes, I could hardly wear them. Evil. I am without any defense, or means to resist any violence of man or beast. Good. But I am cast on an island where I see no wild beast so hard to hurt me, as I saw on the coast of Africa. And what if I had been shipwrecked there? Evil. I have no soul to speak to or relieve me. Good. But God wonderfully sent the ship in near enough to the shore, so I have got out as many necessary things as will either supply my wants or enable me to supply myself, even as long as I live. Upon the whole, where was an undoubted testimony that there was scarce any condition in the world so miserable that there was something negotiative or something positive to be thankful for in it. And let this stand as a direction from the experience of the most miserable of all conditions in this world, that we may always find in it something to comfort ourselves from, and to set in the description of good and evil on the credit side of the account. Having now brought my mind a little to release my condition, and given over looking at to see, to see if I could spy a ship, I say, Given over these things, I began to supply myself to arrange my way of living and to make things as easy to me as I could. I have already described my habitation, which was a tent under the side of a rock, surrounded with a strong pail of posts and cables, but I might not rather call it a wall, for I raised a kind of wall up against it for turfs about two feet thick on the outside, and after some time, some time, I think it was a year and a half, I raised rafters from it, leaning to the rock, and touched or covered it with pots of trees, and such things as I could get, to keep out the rain, which I found at some times of the year very violent, I have already observed how I brought all my goods into this pail, and into the cave which I had made behind me. But I must observe, too, that at first this was a confused heap of goods, which, as they lay into no order, so they look up all my place. I had no room to turn myself, or I set myself to enlarge my cave, and work further into the earth, for it was a loose sandy rock, which yielded easily to the labor I bestowed on it. I bestowed on it. And so, when I found I was pretty safe as to beasts of prey, I worked sideways to the right hand, into the rock, and then 
turning to the right again, worked quite out. It made me a door to come out on the outside of my pale or fortification. This gave me not only regress, as it was a black way to my tent, into my storehouse, but it gave me room to store my goods. And now I began to apply myself to make such necessary things as I found I most wanted, particularly a, a chair and a table. For without these, I was not able to enjoy the few comforts I had in the world. I could not write or eat or do several things with so much pleasure without a table. So I went to work, and where and here I must needs observe that as reason is the substance and origin of the mathematics. So by standing and squaring everything by reason, and by making the most rational judgment of things, every man may be, in time, master every mechanic art. I had never handled a tool in my life, and yet, in time, by labor, application, and contrivance, I found at last that I wanted nothing but I could have made it, especially if I had had tools. However, I made a vengeance of things, even without tools, and some with no more tools than an adze and a hatchet, which perhaps were never made that way before, and that with infinite labor, for example, if I wanted a bird, I had no other way but to cut down a tree, set it on an edge before me, and held it up and held it flat on either side with my axe, till I brought it to be thin as a plank, and then dub it smooth with my adze. It is true, by this method I could make out but one board out of a whole tree, but this I had no remedy for but patience, any more than I had for the prodigious deal of time and labor which it took me up to make a plank on board or board, but my time or labor was little worth, and so it was as well employed one way as another. However, I made me a table and a chair, and I observed both in the first place, and this I did out of the short pieces of board, and I brought on my raft from the ship, but when I had brought out some boards as above, I made large shelves, or the breadth of a foot and a half, one over another, all along one side of my cave, to lay all of my tools, nails, and iron work on, and, in a word, to separate everything at large into their places, and I might come easily at them. I knocked pieces into the wall of the rock, to hang my guns, and all things that would hang up, so that, had my cave been to be seen. It looked like a general magazine of all necessary things, and had everything so real at my hand, and that it was a great pleasure to me to see all my goods in such order, and especially to find my stock of all necessaries so great. And now it was that I began to keep a journal of every day's employment, for indeed, at first I was in too much hurry, and not only hurry as to labor, but in too much discomposure of mind. And my journal would have been full of many dual things. For example, I must have said thus thirteen. After I had got to shore and escaped drowning, instead of being thankful to God for my deliverance, having first vomited with the great quantity of salt water which had got into my stomach, and recovering myself a little, I ran about the shore, wringing my hands and beating my head and face, exclaiming at my misery, and crying out, I was undone, undone, till, tired and faint, I was forced to lie down on the ground to repose, and trust, not sleep, for fear of being endeavored. Some days after this, and after I had been on board the ship, and got all that I could out of her, Yet I could now forbear getting up to the top of the little mountain and looking out to sea, in hopes of seeing a ship. Then, fancy at the vast distance, I spied a sail, pleased myself with the hopes of it. And then, after looking steadily till I was almost blind, lose it quite, and sit down and weep like a child, and thus increase my misery by my folly. But having gotten over these things in some measure, 
and having settled my household stuff in habitation, made me a table and a chair, and all as handsome about me as I could. I began to see my journal, of which I shall here give you the copy, though in it will be told all these particular over again, as long as it lasted, for having no more ink, I was forced to leave it off.